So let me introduce you to uh, Mr. Sukumarang, who is a senior lawyer based in Kota Kinabalu. Uh, Mr. Sukumarang has actually written a book back in uh, 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And the title of the book is The Constitutional Rights of Sabah and Sarawak. And it was published by Sweet and Maxwell, a, a major uh, legal publisher. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the Chief Justice launched your book in KK, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Yes, yes. So thank you very much for, for, for coming and, and talking to us. I think one of the key issues is that uh, increasingly it is quite clear that in the last 10 years, the level of unhappiness among the people of Sabah and Sarawak over this thing called Malaysia Agreement is, is getting higher and higher. And there are various goods and societies which is sort of asking uh, for two things. The first is that they're asking whether there is a legal remedy to this issue of Malaysia Agreement. And secondly, a lot of people asking, uh, you know, saying that uh, it has not worked for the last 50 years and therefore maybe we should look at the international law. So I wanted to ask you as a practicing senior lawyer, also somebody who has written on this issue, uh, is it possible to litigate under Malaysia agreement both domestically and internationally? What is your opinion? To litigate, you mean? Yes, litigate as in, you know, people out there, uh, you know, among the public, a lot of groups are saying that we can actually take uh, the Malaysian government to court in the international arena. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think firstly, yeah, firstly, uh, they have got to pinpoint what the grouses are. I mean, what right. are they complaining? Yes. And secondly, whether it has got a legal basis. Right, no, right. To start with, um, I think with due respect, it is the politicians who have, um, I mean, who have brought these issues up. And very sadly, I do not think that they have studied the various constitutional documents that went to make up um, Malaysia. Uh, one of the major contentions is that Sabah and Sarawak is not, uh, did not come in as uh, states of uh, the 13th or 14th state of uh, you know, Malaysia, but as uh, separate units. In other words, they're looking at the formation as Federation of uh, Malaya as one, uh, the, the Federation of Malaya comprising the 11 states as one component, Sabah as one component, and Sarawak as the third component. And Singapore but, is the fourth component before the left. Yeah, at that time, five. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but that is really not the uh, situation. If you read, you know, the very first article, the Malaysia Agreement says that the colonies of North Borneo and Sarawak shall federate with the, the 11 states of the Federation of Malaya. It didn't say that the states of uh, North Borneo and Sarawak will federate with the Federation of Malaya. So there's a difference. And um, prior to the formation of Malaysia, uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman, the Prime Minister of the Federation of Malaya, during his rounds to Sabah and Sarawak, made it very clear. He said, we invite you as the uh, 12th, 13th, and the 14th states. And All right, you'll put, be accorded. Yeah, put, putting that to one side, but, but what about the, the argument that the people in Sabah and Sarawak were not, consul were not consulted properly? And secondly, uh, being under the, the, the British administration, they're not in a position to decide for themselves whether they want to establish or to join the Federation of, of Malaysia. Uh, that argument actually can be debunked. The fact that there was the Cobol Commission, Cobol Commission, which had interviewed uh, you know, uh, many people who were, who were able to come forward through their uh, native heads and their political um, representatives. Yeah, but the, but, but, yeah, but the argument is that the work of the Cobalt Commission was too heavily influenced by the British and the Malayan governments. And secondly, the colonial administrators in Sabah and Sarawak were told in no uncertain terms to make sure that they whip out support, especially among the native population who really did not understand this concept of joining a larger federation or establishing um, a new country. Yeah, I can understand at that <clears throat> time the education level uh, was pretty low, both in Sabah and, and Sarawak, much lower than 
the education level in the Federation of uh, Malaya. But be that as it may, they are the native leaders who, I presume, could have explained the, these matters. And secondly, it was brought to the respective legislative assemblies of North Borneo at that time and, and in Sarawak. And there was a white paper also produced. And the, the representatives were there. They had the time, you know, to go through. You see, so, so, so uh, and secondly, there was also an independent commission from the United Nations after Indonesia and Philippines, you know, protested. This was a colonial ploy and all that. They came. Of course, I mean, um, I mean, um, there are people who say that it was not properly done and all those things, you see. Sure. Uh, okay, so, okay, leaving that to one side, uh, speaking strictly from legal legal view, not from the political side, mm -hmm. is there any legal remedies if people are not happy and they cannot get a political solution? Are there any legal remedies, for example, uh, you know, to force the federal government to implement uh, the spirit of the agreement? In other words, yes. maximum autonomy for Sabah and Sarawak. Yes, in fact, um, Article uh, 8, if I'm not mistaken, of the... Malaysia agreement itself clearly states that you know if any of the recommendations of the intergovernmental committee is not implemented, the state governments can you know uh, take it up to either through legislative, executive, or other means. So it is up to the state governments concerned to bring this up with the with the federal government. And work, the, 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 the way how it should be resolved is already uh, stated in the Malaysia agreement itself. Yes, but you know, right, one of the, one of the clause that's also written in plain English is that they're supposed to hold a meeting 10 years after the, the, the Federation was established, which is 1973. That meeting never went ahead and after I, that, it sort of went off. I don't think it is one of the... Uh, what uh, matters that were put in the IGC or even in the Cobalt Commission? I don't think so. I, I can't find. You know, I, I, I've, I mean, I heard of this many a times, and I was quite desperately trying to find. You know, where is it stated that after ten years, you know, uh, or after X years, they have got to review the Malaysia uh, agreement? No, I don't think so. Uh, no, it is not to review the, the Malaysia agreement. It is for the three states to come together to discuss uh, you know, the, the establishment of the Malaysian Federation and see how they're going after 10 years. Neither can I find that provision anywhere. Okay. All right. uh, neither can I find it, honestly. Right. Okay, let, let's, let, let's quickly move on. So when you talk about, uh, I asked you the question about legal remedies. So you're saying that yes. this is essentially a political issue. It's up to the political leaders of Sabah and Sarawak, if they're unhappy to raise it with Putrajaya rather than, yeah. a le rather than the legal route. Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. And also many of the rights that were given to them, to Sabah and Sarawak, you know. Sabah and Sarawak, are definitely, as you know, as a starting point, they got much more rights than any of the 11 states. You know. so, but some of these rights were just given up by the respective states. English, religion, etc. They were just surrendered by the different uh, governments that were in power, you know. Like so when Sabah adopted, yeah, so example is Sabah adopting uh, Islam as the official state religion in the 19th. Yeah, 19th uh, they were in a hurry. They were in a hurry to please the federal leaders. You see, they gave up English, mm. etc. You know, mm. so, so, I mean, uh, then they say they lost, uh, then people say they lost the rights. No, they, the rights were given up, you know, rather than they were uh, forcibly, you know, taken away from them. Okay, well, let, uh, okay, let, let's talk about the, the, the one that's very specific. Sabahans are always, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, raising the issue about the so-called uh, promise of a 40%, uh, what do you call it, uh, rebate. Oil, uh, yes. On that issue, can they sue the federal government to get the money? I mean, legally speaking? Um, if you read the relevant um, uh, provisions, uh, I think it's Article 112D, uh, you know, I can't really remember. I think it's uh, some, uh, somewhere in Article 112. 
of the federal constitution. It says the 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 if there are any uh, the allocation of the resources which they had promised would also be dependent on the uh, financial viability of the federal government itself. It is not only the state needs, but also that, let me see if I can just quickly uh, flip through it. No, no, that's fine. So, so, so you're saying that if they were to litigate on this issue, it is not straightforward. It is not straightforward. Right. Now, uh, coming back to this issue of, again, uh, because I, I do not really want to go into the political area, I just want to talk to you strictly as, as a legal person. Is it possible to bring this dispute in the international arena or is it not possible? I, I don't think that, because the parties to the international arena, I, ICG, you know, International Court of Justice, has got to be the, the, the government itself. The sovereign government. Right. It has got to be a sovereign government. It will be a non-starter, to my mind. Right. So, so if, if, if somebody, okay, say, say the international route is, is not viable, say somebody wants to sue the federal government over any aspect of the Malaysia agreement, how would they go about it? Because uh, somebody did try in Sabah over the bonanization case. Uh, yes. They did not even proceed know, beyond yeah. the first stage. So my yes. question is that, if somebody wants to do something, say people in the community are feeling hot, the nationalist group want to mount a court case, how do they go about doing it? It, 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 it? The lead should be taken by the state government itself. Okay, so basically you're saying if the state government refused to take the legal route, there's no legal remedy yeah, for the that, ordinary that, that people be, in the I think community. It can be knocked off on the grounds of local standard, you know. Right, right. You know, Tell me, yeah. uh, strictly speaking from the legal point of view, uh, do you believe that uh, most of the so-called agreement between the federal government and the state government under the Malaysia agreement has most of it, in your opinion, has been delivered or there's lots of areas where you think that the federal government has not delivered or simply just ignore it? No, uh, to my mind, uh, I think every aspect uh, that was recommended in the Intergovernmental Committee had been implemented had been implemented. If they are not implemented, there are ways and means of this, the state government uh, bringing it up, either through executive you know, or, or legislative or other means. Well, if, if, if that's the case, then basically all the unhappiness uh, stems from the fact that for the last 50 years, uh, the political leaders of Sabah and so has basically done nothing. Uh, they have not only done nothing, but they were the ones, I think, responsible for giving up some of the rights. Right. Some of the fundamental rights. And, and, and it, right. So speaking legally, is it possible to get back these rights or are they are gone forever? Um, I think what, uh, because some of the, there are consequential effects, you know. Once they pass in the assembly, to make, for instance, you know, uh, the the king, the young Gipertonagong, as the head of the religion, it has gone through the federal, you know, and there were also changes in the federal constitution. So we are not seeing just sim a simple constitutional change in the, you know, in the state constitution. It also involves the, you know, the federal constitution. Of course, anything can be done with the cooperation of of, of both the governments. But is it that easy? Mm. Is it that easy? Yes. And also, you, you have to remember that uh, Putrajaya normally do not want to offer any special deals to Sabah and Sarawak because they worry about the other states in the peninsula, states with strong state nationalism like Kelantan, Trengganu and Johor. Yes, yes. So they yeah, will be very be. cautious. Yeah. So, so basically, what, what, what I'm hearing from you is that it is your learner opinion that uh, if there's going to be any litigation, it will have to be taken out by the state government because they yes. are the one with the legal standing to take any action. Yes, if there's going yes. to be any breaches of any agreement. Yes, I'm of that firm view. Right. So, okay, if that is the case, if the legal remedy is not available to the ordinary people in the street, then what is the political remedy then? They've got to bring in a state government that will implement uh, or try to take back the rights. Or a state government that is strong enough will fight for more autonomy. To me, fighting for greater autonomy in the 80s where they have the rights, I think is the way forward. 
Okay. Rather well, than trying to get back. Well, the record is not very good, right? Because we know in the 1980s, uh, Parti Besatu Sabah stood very strongly on state nationalism. Uh, and uh, how should I put it? The history is, is, is not very pleasant. Uh, they lost power in 1994. But in yes. between, uh, Putrajaya imposed what is known as an economic recession on Sabah because uh, they saw PBS as part of the opposition from 1990 onwards. Mm -hmm. So the record is, is not very good in terms of confronting the federal government on, on, on this issue. Yes. Yes. And recently, we have the GPS in Sarawak trying to stand on, on state nationalism as well. And that led to the formation of this federal cabinet committee uh, specifically to look at uh, MA63 uh, issues. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. interestingly, if you look at the details of the work of the committee, a lot of the things they discussed were actually uh, not in the MA MS63 issue. It's more of a bureaucratic administrative issues. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and also they try to bring in the issue of uh, oil royalties, which is again not part of MA63. That's more to do with the PDA 1974. So, so my, my question is that um, politically, uh, if, if, if the legal remedy is not available to the ordinary people of Sabah and Sarawak, then politically, uh, how do they go about it? Because it, it, you know, the recent record is not very good in terms of electing people who can actually uh, get the federal government to do something. Yeah, yeah. basically, I mean, the people have got to know uh, what, uh, what they want and uh, whether it was in the first place um, stated in the Cobol Commission and translated into the IGC and uh, whether those rights found their way into the federal constitution. But the counter and argument, the yeah, but the argument of that is that, you know, the, a lot of people said the Cobol Commission work and the IGC work uh, it really doesn't matter what happened at that two stage. What happened is what was eventually, uh, you know, written down into the updated version of the fifty seven constitution, right? What is actually written down in law is is, is the final outcome. Uh, yes. Whatever, whatever yeah, was I mean, discussed, yeah, whatever was discussed in Cobalt Commission, and the IGC re really counts for nothing. Legally speaking, it counts for nothing. It's just part of the discussion. Yes. So, that so was how, the yeah. fact finding, the fact finding, fact finding mission, sure. and it translated into the five uh, committees under IGC who discuss how to amend the fifty seven constitution. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So, 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 yes. my question is that since the the legal route is not available, and the so called political route is not available for whatever reasons, we can say uh, quite clearly that the political leaders of Sabah and Sarawak for the last 50, 60 years. Uh, have not yes. sort of confronted the federal government and in some ways have given up some of the so-called rights of Sabah and Sarawak. If the political route is not available, the legal route is not available, so where do people vent their frustration over this issue of autonomy? Where, where, where is the vow that they can vent their frustration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you see, um, you were saying just now the Bonionization case, you know, thing with Bernard Fong, you know. Yes. yes. And... Um, uh, the, the, the reason why they lost at the Court of Appeal, it was, I think, more, more on, on local standard. Yes, yes. It is more on local standard. That means the litigant didn't have you know, enough rights to bring it. You know? They didn't suffer any more special rights. You know? So but the this, way... It's this, is the, this is the point that you made earlier, that it is only the state government who has a local standard to, 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 deal, to deal with absolutely. this. Yeah, yeah. But, but if they can show that they have suffered more than the general public, then, you know, I know that there is such a, uh, it's such a difficult task. It's an uphill task, certainly. That is why, for all these reasons, Sabah and Sarawak, they have got to be very, very practical and fight for greater autonomy in the areas where they have already have the rights, rather than trying to fight back for rights which they have given up. What about the idea that uh, perhaps looking back uh, 50, 60 years, maybe the wrong way of looking at this issue. Maybe the right way of looking at it is to actually do a, a, a realistic look at what is happening in federal state relationship now in 2020. And to move forward, we need a completely new model rather than try to keep looking back, trying to find a solution. Obviously, you know, the situation 50, 60 years ago is completely yes, yes, different yes. now. True, true. Um, I think that was the reason why the cabinet committee on, you know, uh, was set up 
to look into the grouses of you know of Sabah and Sarawak. And I would say in this um, review committee, uh, perhaps even the other states should be included. Yes, but even the, the other states should be and 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 look into the possibility of how they can strengthen the. Uh, the, the, the principles of federalism. Well, you know, the, the, the Malaysian example is actually uh, quite simple compared to other federal state system because our system is very clear. We have the three schedule lists, you yes. know, the stately federal concurrent list. Uh, what do you think of this idea adding on a fourth list that is specific to Sabah and Sarawak? The, the Sabah and Sarawak already have got the uh, list two. Uh, li, uh, one is a state list. Then there is a, a special list for Sabah and Sarawak. Yes, that's the and appendix. And there is a concurrent list. Yes. And there is a special concurrent list. So right. it, it is already there. Okay. And, and it's a matter of adding on, you know. Right. So, 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 so but, but you, you're, you're saying that even though it's on a list, uh, in terms of the actual administrating of the thing, the state government has actually given up a lot of the rights throughout the years. Yes. Yes. They they they. they so it's just a matter of reclaiming then 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 it is it's just a matter in your opinion it's just a matter of reclaiming the rights through bureaucratic means yes yeah through the cooperation you know uh, with the federal government if the federal government is friendly with the state government that will make things easier and if the and but the the but the <laughs> I have to laugh because you know, right? For the last what, 40 years, Sarawak has been always friendly to the federal government. It's always been under Sarawak Barisan National. And uh, two, two, well, one single family in Sarawak has ruled for more than 30 years. In Sabah, basically since 1994, uh, it was basically under Amno Sabah. So yes. they've always been, been, been close to the federal government and yet, you know, people are unhappy because they think they're losing their so-called autonomy. So my, my question is that there is sort of a, this grey area where on the one hand, people are unhappy, they want to seek a legal remedy, but according to your legal opinion is that it's very difficult because only the, the state authorities or state institutions have the right to appear or to litigate on this issue. Then some, some of the nationalist groups are saying, forget about Malaysia. Malaysia was a big con game. Let's take this thing at the international arena. And you're saying that you can't be done in the international arena as well. So it's the question is, yeah, so the question is, uh, where is the remedy? Where is the space for the remedy? How do you deal with the unhappiness? Make good with whatever you have. Make good. That is, ask for greater autonomy in the areas that you have. But the people are unhappy with the present situation. That, you know, so even if you make good on what you have, people are already unhappy with what they have. Well, they got to, uh, every five years, they go to the, you know, the polls to bring in a, a, a state government that can fight for them. It's difficult for, for an individual, you know. Yes, yes, yes. You know, to, to bring up any, I mean, the individuals will always be unhappy for, for you know, many things. But it is the, you know, the collective unhappiness that is, you know, important. And that can be shown uh, every five years through the through the ballots. Yes, but, so but they you, want to bring a government. I know, I understand where you're coming from. But the thing is that if you look at the two most recent election, uh, 2018 yes. and 2013, all the political parties that stand strongly for Sabah or uh, Sabah Sabah or Sarawak rights, uh, people like SAPP, uh, Jeffrey Kittingan's group, all those groups didn't do very well in, in the elections. Yes. That is true. So, so what does it show? Can we say that people have rejected them? People have rejected their policies? I, I don't know. No, I, I, mean, I mean, you know, what, what, what I'm hearing from you is that legally is, there's no route available. Yeah, I can't Political, think of, you know, pe Politically, there's also no route available because those politicians standing up for so-called MS-63 who are lobbying for, I don't know, Sabah, Sarah Rice, whatever it is, they never win their elections. So, so, so those people are unhappy, assuming that uh, what, uh, they are quite a sizable part of the population. Where do they go? Uh, again, you know, they, they, they you know, peace-loving people will always wait for for five years to cast their vote. And 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 you know, and, and you know the joke in Sabah, right? It is not possible to win anymore. 
because there's too many PD, PTIs people involved in the voting process. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that I'm uh, fully aware. That I'm fully aware. Well, all right. Well, well. Thank you very much for speaking to us. I think, uh, you, I think you have really uh lay out in a very uh clear and concise manner about the difficulties and also that this issue is really complicated by uh too many factors, both at the domestic level, also at the federal.